Good morning. Let me welcome you to this bright, sunny, and not yet rainy morning uh, for a discussion of police and counterinsurgency. My name is Daniel Serwer. I'm vice president for Centers of Innovation here at USIP, and one of those one of the activities under Centers of Innovation is something uh, we call uh, the Initiative for Security Sector Governance, which has been very ably led by Bob Perito, who uh, has uh, for many years now uh, relentlessly pursued the issue of police uh, in war as the title of this particular book. And if you haven't seen the book that we're talking about this morning, uh, it's got this uh, nice cover. It's not published by USIP. It's published by Lynn Reiner, and uh, there are order forms outside. Uh, this is an extraordinary book, a book uh, that is very hard-hitting, that minces no words about uh, some of the failures that have occurred in what we increasingly recognize as one of the most critical functions in post-conflict, let's call them that for the moment, uh, stability operations. A subject that has really uh, <clears throat> stumped us a good deal and that some says particularly in the United States government uh, for reasons I've never quite understood. Uh, we never developed a national police force. We don't have a in national interior ministry. Uh, we have not, uh, we don't, simply don't have at the federal level all the institutions that, that many other countries have developed uh, for law and order purposes. So there's a general problem. I don't think, I don't know of any country that feels it's gotten police right. Uh, but there's a specific problem for the Americans, which is that uh, we, we just are institutionally ill-prepared for this subject. It's hard-hitting, but I want to emphasize right from the first that the criticisms are not aimed at the people who do this work. Uh, we have an extraordinary array of people, both military and civilian, government officials, contractors, who have devoted themselves in recent years to uh, training and preparing police, uh, not only uh, in the more distant past in the Balkans, but uh, more <laughs> recently in Iraq and Afghanistan. And... Uh, they, they are not only committed and devoted, but uh, do an extraordinary amount of work under extraordinarily dangerous conditions. So this isn't about the commitment and courage of the individuals, which I don't doubt for a moment. This is about uh, the programs, our own capacity to administer them and to implement them about the goals of those programs and whether they've been well conceived. And the greatest service, it seems to me, we can do to those who <coughs> courageously do this work is to fix what's broken in these programs. And so uh, it's with those few words of tribute to those who courageous few at the, at the front lines that I ask Bob Perito to make the first presentation. We'll go through the panel in the order that they're seated. They come from an extraordinary array of backgrounds, as is proper for this subject, from the military, uh, from criminal justice uh, academia, from security studies, from uh, Mark uh, works on government effectiveness, essentially. Uh, this is an extraordinary panel with uh, diverse perspectives, and I expect a stimulating discussion. Bob, please lead Thank us you. off. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Uh, 
And in the beginning, when we thought about this subject, I thought, well, this is going to be nice. There will be about four or five people in the audience who will all sit around and have coffee. But uh, my assistant told me last night we had 135 RSVPs, which I think speaks to the importance of this subject, which I think is finally finding its time in, uh, in the Washington policy process. Um, the book, which, uh, which uh, Dan showed you, uh, really began in, with a conversation about a little over two years ago. I was down in Quantico. I was speaking to a group of Marine officers who had just returned from Iraq. And at the end of my presentation, um, one of the officers raised his hand and he said, sir, he said, uh, after the, the fighting died down um, in Al-Anbar province, uh, but insurgency was still continuing, he said, my unit was given the job of training the Iraqi police. And he said, you know, we, we looked on the Internet. We asked questions up our chain of command. We, we sought advice. And he said, we, we just couldn't come up with a curriculum uh, for doing this work or, or much guidance at all. And he said, did we miss something? And I said, no, I don't think you missed anything because I don't think there's anything in the literature on this subject. Um, this is an issue which really hasn't been addressed. Um, after that conversation, I, I came back to my office and I was talking to, to Professor Bailey, and uh, you know I asked this question with some temerity. You know, could we answer this question? Because this is a huge question. The question is, what is the role of local police in combating an insurgency, specifically in a situation where U.S. military forces are engaged in a counterinsurgency fight in defense of a host government? And if we could define that role then how would we train those indigenous police to perform that function? Um, this question was certainly relevant in Iraq and extremely relevant in Afghanistan today. The fact that there is nothing, and we then checked and looked very seriously through the literature on this topic, uh, brought us to the conclusion that we ought to make the effort, that it was worth the try, and we ought to write something that would try to plug that gap. But in order to address this topic in its infinite complexities, we thought there were a lot of issues out there that we really needed to do some thinking about, and those issues will be reflected in the presentations of the panel this morning. Do local police have a role in controlling insurgency and terrorism following an intervention by an international military force? What is the division of labor <clears throat> under those circumstances between the international military, the local military, and the local police. How should local police perform their duties? How should they be trained? And what is their role? And if you look at the literature, their role turns out to be contributing to the legitimacy of the local government, not so much in performing security functions. But how does all of that fit together? And then if you get those things right and you answer those questions. What's the role of the supervisory organizations, the ministries, the parliaments, the executive, that all are responsible for the conduct and, and uh, the performance of the police? And then if you've addressed all those issues, then you have to think about the United States. And, and as Dan suggested, in the United States, we have some, some bureaucratic deficiencies and we have some structural challenges and we need policies and we need funding and we need personnel to actually go out and do this work. So we decided to do the book, and we started out by, by looking at um, the experiences that the U.S. has had in Iraq and Afghanistan, which have not been successful. Um, just a, a couple of examples. In, in 2002, 2007, um, in Iraq, the Iraqi National Police um, were guilty of acting as sectarian death squads. They were taken offline by the U.S. military. Uh, their leaders were arrested and they were retrained before they could be put back in the fight. In Afghanistan, um, very recently, both General McChrystal and the former National Intelligence uh, Chairman, uh, Admiral Blair, said that many people in Afghanistan regard the Afghan National Police as a greater threat to their security than the Taliban. And so we have problems with, with these programs. So we looked at that experience. We then looked back over the experiences that we've had, and many of you have been in those programs because I was there with you. That shows you how old I am. Starting in Panama, you know, and working up through uh, Somalia and El Salvador and all of these other, other operations where we learned lessons and where we did get some things right. 
and so we tried to catalog those and make them available. And then we looked at the experiences of counterinsurgencies and counterterrorism and countercrime, and we looked at the theory and the practice, and we looked at successful case studies, um, and we tried to bring the uh, kind of find what was the essence of all of that experience and bring it together in a way that, that, that made some sense and was coherent. And then we looked at the training regimes and what we were doing, what we failed to do, and what might make sense. And then we looked at the structural problems. We took a security sector reform approach and we looked at what are the institutions of government that are required if you're going to go about and do these programs. And then finally, we thought about what are the changes that might be required in the U.S. government to make the U.S. government perform more effectively. And so um, with that overview, um, I'll turn it over to the panel. Thank you. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Baird. You want to stand up? Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's better, better if right. you deliver your initial remarks. The camera will get you better. Got it. Hi, good morning. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Baird. I see some friends in the audience. Uh, I'm at the Marine Corps Center for Regular Warfare in Quantico. Uh, the Center for Regular Warfare, in some of this you'll see in the discussions here when you tie insurgency, uh, criminal activity, terrorism, violence, and stability operations, mm -hmm. that's all encompassed under regular warfare as far as the joint operating concept. So we, we deem this all under regular warfare, so I come at it from a, uh, that perspective. Um, I was in Iraq in, in uh, 2006 and uh, Afghanistan in 2004, and pr principally in Iraq, we dealt with significant uh, challenges with building the police there, and we're continuing to see those challenges on through to Afghanistan to this day. So my perspective is uh, about a year ago, I, I literally wandered in, found Madeline, and walked into Bob Perito's office and said, hey, I got a problem. I'm at this center, and we're looking at police development. You got anything on that? So uh, about a year later than his original discussion is when I kind of walked up and uh, had the same issue. So this has been a longstanding uh, challenge. We look at capability development in the force. What do we need as a military to be successful in these environments? How do you define that environment? Uh, if you can't see the slide, General Conway is a commandant of the Marine Corps, and basically he articulates that um, we're going to see uh, a blend here, a hybrid blend between traditional and irregular tactics, between decentralization and planning and execution of non-state actors as well as state actors. So the definitions of war are, are changing and blending, and we're seeing what, what has been termed as irregular warfare. So what does that look like when we look at these various challenges? You see forces that are out there with irregular tactics. They also use conventional capabilities such as rockets, mortars. They then use criminality and terrorism, and that's what's defined as a hybrid threat in, in our nomenclature. They use that simultane simultaneity where they will adapt, have a mix of conventional, unconventional, state, non-state, very hard to identify what are we targeting when we roll in and attempt to use force to attack or deter or dissuade them in the battle space. But it's all about political objectives. These pictures here are from uh, the Governance Center in Ramadi in about uh, 2006. So you can see the Marines sandbagging the Governance Center, basically the equivalent of the, uh, any of the county government complexes here in the United States. I do that to illustrate what we're talking about here, we're talking about very violent environments where governance is literally under attack. Uh, they're violently opposed, sometimes by insurgents trying to take over, but sometimes by just detractors uh, and terrorists. You also have the aspects of it that it's not just a military aspect. We're fully aware as a military force that it takes other activities, political, economics, uh, developmental to get at this, but it's this political power that's the central issue here where who's in control of that and how do you gain legitimacy, right, the, the will of the people. That's best done through the, that police force that's engaging uh, as a government element right there with the people. 
And if they're legitimate, the people see the government as more legitimate, providing essential services, providing immediate security, helping them with their challenges. Obviously, for uh, the Marine Corps, we're not new to training police. There's a picture of the Haitian gendarmerie being uh, inspected by a Marine in 1915. So roughly 100 years later, we have a Marine in uh, Afghanistan training the Afghan police. So if we think this is some kind of transitional requirement for forces to do this, uh, it's not so. We see it both. Uh, the challenge is that the general purpose forces are prohibited from training police by law as a, as a capability. So it's done in Iraq and Afghanistan by exception. So our challenge is what capability needs to be retained in the forces. Uh, that's addressed kind of in the book of the limitations of military forces and training police. We're not to protect and serve. Our missions are, are relatively different. So there's a, a challenge here that, that is a gap in non-military capability of, of a need for a capability in, in the government to be able to do that and quickly and in that high threat environment. It also gets at how effective are you at training the police? Is it numbers? I've seen vast numbers of police trained and then I go there and I say, well, okay, where are all those guys that are trained? Well, it doesn't, <laughs> they don't, they aren't capable. <laughs> so then you start peeling the grape back and say, okay, what, how many arrests have they done? How many convictions have they done? How many times has someone been sent to jail and, oh, by the way, maybe, you know, brought back in and, and rehabilitated or given, pulled back out and, and given a job or something like that? So... Those are significant challenges in, in training the police. I've also observed as we developed a police force in Fallujah and Greater Al Ambar province that there's a greater framework for the rule of law. You have, if you can't see it in the back, you have the judiciary, uh, police, and corrections. We're well aware of this framework as we go in and try and partner with that police force. The challenge is okay, who's got the judiciary reform? Who's, who's working in that high-threat environment, those corrections? There are people who are doing it, and they're very capable of doing it. The challenge is, is in that high-threat environment, that immediate activity that you need to get uh, all these detained combatants somehow processed, somehow vetted, somehow uh, separated. And there's a morphing of what are these police supposed to do um, are they supposed to fight insurgents? And they certainly can be effective given police intelligence and the capability to root out what criminality is in a given environment. But it's when you pair them to a military force, they're not trained and equipped as a military force, nor should they be. And that's addressed really uh, by the, the gentleman in their book talking about the limitations of, of military capability. And then you get into more bigger issues that, frankly, are beyond luckily, my scope, which is, okay, we're after the rule of law. Whose law is it? Is it Islamic law or is it Roman, Judeo-Christian? What, what law are we attempting to do here? Because that's important to make sure that you're, you're engaging them at their level. Why? It's about legitimacy. So are you coming in with a foreign concept or are you coming in with a concept that, that is their concept in assisting them? Corruption, uh, tremendous difficulty and challenge for a uniform service to get at corruption and to, to, to look at ways to vet these leaders because, as I've seen it, uh, it's the leaders that are key. Have you identified the proper police leader? Have you trained him? Have you developed him? Have you vetted him? And are you monitoring him? And most importantly, I think, are you protecting him? Are they uh, able to be intimidated or, or worse yet, murdered? I think the last point there, most only want justice, uh, vice the rule of law. As a pragmatic person who's seen the challenge of these people, they don't want some philosophical idea of rule of law and all this. They want justice. If something's taken from them, if they have been abused, if they have something, uh, that's all we want. And it's really about 100 years ago I think we had, you know, that, that kind of thing going on out west in, in the Wild West. So... We need to look at it from a justice perspective, providing immediate justice to them. That's what adversaries give. That's what a Taliban might give is justice. It might be ruthless justice, but it's justice. 
security and development have a fascinating relationship, as I've observed in, in both locations, and I'm trying to speak broadly to not get us focused on a singular conflict because that tends to unravel any dialogue about this. But security will enable that development. We've seen how you need that security capability to bring in the development. But development also enhances security by reducing those grievances. You know, then we put them to work. We allow them to have uh, jobs, free market. Um, so the coalition forces have to provide a bubble around those police forces and allow them to develop. That's a very complex balance on the ground. When you're really talking about how do we partner, how do we operate, how do we leave an operating base, and you have to do it effectively and not just do it by name or by title. Well, give me a few of them so I can go do an operation. It has to be building their capability and supporting. And then finally, as we saw effectively in, in Fallujah, the concept uh, then was Team Fallujah, but the idea of partnership <clears throat> between the Army, the police, and the coalition forces. It literally got down to all three being in one location at one spot, three of them together. It built trust, it built cooperation, and it built unity of effort so that they then begin to get, al get along because they also have internal problems between police and Army. I think uh, I'd offer this, it takes time, and that's not something necessarily that our culture is uh, attuned to. Up top is Ramadi, uh, Falu uh, Ramadi, Iraq, in the western capital of Al Anbar province, the provincial capital, in 2005. The bottom is basically 2008. This is the transition ceremony in the bottom in 2008 when that governance center you saw in the first photos is transitioned back to Iraqi control. So this is the celebration here roughly three years later. Who, who would have made that projection that in 2005 when it was going very tough, when it was very hard going, would it have turned around like that? Um, and that's, that's really the challenge that, that you need to make sure that as we develop these programs, they're seamless and that whatever long-term government programs of a larger long-term capacity, we in the uniform services are not countering but enabling and transitioning back to so that we can step back and allow – what I would consider professionals to go in and, and pick up where we left off so that it's a seamless transition. Why? Because you're talking about a person on the ground, and they're going to go, well, wait a minute. You've been helping me. Who's going to help me now? Who, who's my mentor? Who's my uh, facilitator? So I would offer that. And, and I guess this is what that gets at, is it's about that guy. It doesn't look like any of the police we're used to. Uh, and, in fact, most, most of them early on do hide their faces just because of the challenges they face. Uh, but I think we're getting better in, as a force about advising and building capabilities. And uh, this book is a tremendous resource for people who are getting ready to go, who have no familiarization with advising police and understanding the broader problems, uh, as I talked about, rule of law, development, and, frankly, the limitations of military force and the benefits of professionals in law enforcement development. I think that concludes my 10 minutes. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Baird. Uh, Professor David Bailey, co-author of The Police at War. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I'm going to go right to the heart of what I think the issue is for this morning, which is how do you – what is the role of indigenous police in a counterinsurgency situation in any operating theater where there is still ongoing conflict, and how should those police be trained? I have two, uh, two general points to make today uh, uh, that are about the, what I consider to be the shortcomings of American training of police abroad in these situations in the past, and they are these. First, our training has been much too militarized. And we have, by doing that, we have lost the comparative advantage that the police can contribute to legitimate government and the standing up of a legitimate government in those theaters. Secondly, our training has been too technically Western. We have modeled it too much on the police practices of developed countries, and we've not thought nearly enough about what you need in non-Western settings. Now, let me talk about first the training, then I'm going to say something about the rationale for what, what we recommend, and then how do you get it done. Uh, first, about what the training should emphasize. We think it should emphasize three orientations that indigenous police should have in their heads as they do policing. And those three orientations are the following. 
First, to be available, available to solicitations from the public with respect to the grievances, the problems that are on their mind. Secondly, it should be to be responsive to requests from individuals. I keep stressing individuals, not government. Individuals, the population, who are the ones who are feeling the need for legitimate and effective government. Thirdly, they must be taught to be fair. And this means to treat policing as a de the delivery of a public good. They must not be corrupt, and they must not be, they must not be in, the, in the hip pockets of politicians. And furthermore, they must distribute security in a fair and impartial way. Uh, impartial way. These are the three, I think, we think, motivations or orientations that the police should carry in to their job and the delivery of police services. We think this is the core of what police training should, func uh, should focus on. Um, <clears throat> now, it, it, clearly, the police are going to have to do some other technical things. They're going to have to uh, guard borders, probably. They're going to have to control crowds. They're going to have to collect intelligence. They're going to have to be proactive sometimes with respect to counterterrorism. Understood. At the same time, when they do all of these things, they are tacked on to a police force that behaves in the way that I have described. So uh, what I am saying is that the key to legitimating government in such a theater is for a police that services the public with respect to what they need and does so in an impartial way. Uh, it is not technical proficiency in preserving scenes of crime, in doing forensic analysis with respect to communications, with respect to using fingerprints and all of that. Those can be important, but if you begin there, you've made a mistake. I think you have to begin with respect to the philosophy in the heads of the people who are providing justice to individuals. And having said that, uh, we propose a training curriculum, which, I, which is on the board. Uh, I'm going to let you people read it for yourself. I won't read it to you. I assume most of you can read. Uh, so have a look. Have a look. <clears throat> All of this, of course, is in the book, which makes a lovely Christmas gift for everybody in your family. Uh, so you can study it at your leisure. Uh, now, um, let me compare what we suggest, this, that we think this should be the core of a curriculum abroad. Now, now what we did was when we, we took this and we said, okay, if this is what we think should be done, what exactly is happening now? And we tried to get information on training programs, whether they're UN, multinational, uh, done in Afghanistan, Haiti, wherever. We tried to get copies of this, and I've got to tell you, they don't exist. Colonel Beard is exactly right. If you try to, if you go into the U.S. government and say, I would like to see an array of curricula that have been developed, that we've delivered abroad, where did it begin, where does it end up, it doesn't exist. There is no library, not only in the U.S. government, that has all of these training programs, but it doesn't exist in Canada or Britain. It doesn't exist in the U.N. A person like, like Bob, when he is in the field and asks for help, it couldn't be provided because that basic library of resource does not exist. And I consider that a scandal. We have spent billions of dollars on training abroad, and that is not a matter of public record. Period. All right. We then we did take a look uh, at, at a few that we were a few curricula that we were given by friends. This is stuff you know that fell off the back of the truck, because that's the only way that we could get it. And this is what we find with respect to training programs that were given in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Timor Leste. We found that about 50 percent of training is uh, devoted to officer safety and firearms training. Uh, standard operating procedures, and this means how you stop cars, how you search buildings, how you look for IADs, uh, how you stop and frisk, how you do roadblocks, that's another 25 percent. That's 75 percent of the curricula that is normally given. Local law, training in local law is no more than 10 percent in the curricula that we looked at. 
And finally, core policing, the kind of principles that I've talked to you about, is less than uh, 20% of the training that is currently given, whether international missions or American missions or any other mission uh, abroad. And I consider that not good enough and, ex and, and exemplifies what I think is the problem with what's going on in training at the moment. Now, why do we recommend the kind of training that I've said? And here, actually, uh, Bob Beard has probably given this portion of my, of my talk. Uh, it's basically because the police have a comparative advantage that the military do not have. The military can provide security, but you do not provide legitimacy by an indigenous government, by either the indigenous military's activities or the foreign military activity. It's essential because within that bubble, he used that good word, within a bubble of security that the military can provide, the police can then work and do their thing. Their comparative advantage, and this has now become fairly standard in international coin doctrine, is to win hearts and minds. The military have trouble in, in, as a result of what they do in winning hearts and minds. That should be what the police do. Now, other government institutions are going to be important as well. The phrase we're now using is whole of government. But to get those other government uh, uh, activities up and going, you also need the kind of you, – you also need policing. So you need military to provide a bubble, and then you need the police who act in a legitimating way. Um, the implication here is that there has to be – that there is a division of labor that shifts over time between the military and the police. Basically, the military uh, uh, does clearing – the police and military then do the holding, and finally, the uh, building of civil government is the police function without the military. Now, the problem here is that this is a very difficult, very intricate dance for commanders to bring off. When do you shift? You know, how do you mix these things so, so that you, you get requisite security? At the same time, you don't lose the comparative advantage which is getting the people on your side. How do you get that at the same time? And this, I would suggest to you, is something that this, the making of this decision, the use of these resources in a way that changes over time in terms of its composition, in terms of its focus, is the key decision in a counterinsurgency theater. And it is, it is difficult. It is very similar. Uh, domestically to the, to the decision that uh, American and other police commanders face in facing hostile crowds. When do you use condign force? When do you hold back? When do you have reserves there? When do you use a soft approach? When do you use a hard approach? This, we have analogs for this in other areas, and I begin to think that we need to share uh, um, this, this kind of problem of hard force, soft force, uh, 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 in, when, when facing uh, changing uh, 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 a security situation. Um, I'm going to put up here next, uh, oh, I do this, I think, page, no, that's not it. Can you do this? <laughs> Sorry. The there we are. I want to put up now, just as a kind of a summary to what I've said with respect to the justification of how you use the police and how you use the military, read these three principles. <clears throat> David, I, f I fear that some people won't be able to see them. Would you mind if I read them out loud? Or are would you, you like to? Are, are, there, are there that illiterate people? <laughs> there <laughs> there may be. The podium's oh, above. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Shall no, I read no, them or you? Yeah, no, no, you can read them. No, no, I'll read them. I can read them. Okay, let me do this. The great effectiveness multiplier, I don't like to do this, this is kind of, anyhow. The great effectiveness multiplier in the use of state power against violence is the allegiance and support of the public. Fundamental. Three, in order for governments to gain public support, responsibility for security should be entrusted in so far as possible to police deployed among the population who minimize the use of force and who act in accordance with accepted standards of human rights. I hope this is blindingly obvious to all of you. Third, capturing, killing, or imprisoning people committing violent acts are unlikely to be effective as a long-term solution to insecurity 
unless guided by precise intelligence identifying perpetrators or infrastructure. I want to make a comment about these three principles, and that is these three principles are common to three areas of law enforcement. Crime prevention against violent, ordinary, ordinary violent crime, and well as counterterrorism and insurgency. It's interesting, as we went back and looked at the literatures in all of these areas, we kept coming back to these principles. And if you look at the, at, the, at the information on crime prevention that's been generated by the National Institute of Justice and so forth over the last 40 years, you will find that these principles surface. And the people who are now working in the counterinsurgency area are also rediscovering these principles. I think they're powerful. And they all turn on the essential point of getting the public on the side of government and how you do it. All right. Now, as, as Bob points out, you, you, do have to, you do have to bring together at one point, you, or put it this way, you have to, you have to shape your, what you can do in policing with respect to what the environment allows you to do. All right? That's this intricate dance that I talk about. And if uh, somebody will poke this thing again. This is, <clears throat> don't take this, <clears throat> this to the bank, <clears throat> but it's a suggestive. Uh, that with the security level, the police role changes. In war, it is none. There are various then phases in between where what the military do and what the police do, they do simultaneously, but the role of the police has to change until finally you get down to a, a benign security situation and then you do full-scale police. All right? Now, as I say, you, the, how you do this in particular theaters, how you read this, how you assess, and, and what the mix is going to be, I can't tell you standing here. This is something that gifted local commanders have to figure out for themselves. But they have to be aware that this isn't an either or. We're talking about military force being used as condign force maybe by other, other uh, security agencies and at the same time a modulation over time. But never forget where you want to get and where you want to get is a legitimate government capable of standing on its own and serving its own people. That's where you want to get. And you want to make sure that in providing security, you do not lose sight of that end, of that end state. All right, let me finish up by simply saying this. How do you know when you get the priorities right and you've got a police force that does the good things that I'm talking about? What's the test for a legitimate force? And I will give you the test that we suggest in the book. It is this. It is. <clears throat> what do parents, do parents teach their children, parents, in this country that you're working in, do parents teach their children that they're, when they're away from home and they, need, and they need help of any sort, that they go and look for a cop? I submit to you that if the answer to that is yes, you've got a legitimate police force. If the answer to that is no, you've not got a legitimate police force. That's where you want to go. And let me say this. I've tried this test in a variety of countries, developed, underdeveloped, in different audiences in the United States. The reaction is always the same. People nod their heads. And I can see some smiles out there in this room as well. They recognize the fairness of this. And what's especially interesting to me is not only does the public recognize this as a fair test, but so do cops. That the police, it, the, pe the people you're training can't deny this as worthwhile achieving. So already you've got them, at least, shall I say, on the defensive, accepting that this is something that they would consider to be a fair test of their own activities. So this is the test of, of, of where you want to get your police force in several contexts of insecurity. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, you're a tough professor. You give a, a, hard, uh, a hard standard to meet, um, but an important one. I'm going to insert a little uh, advertisement here and invite David and others in the room uh, to submit curricula, however obtained from whatever truck they fell <laughs> off, uh,
to the international network to promote the rule of law, which USIP uh, administers on the Internet. Uh, and if they can be made available publicly, that is, uh, we would make them available through uh, international network to promote the rule of law. And I'll ask institute staff in the room to make sure the brochures for that uh, Internet-based uh, discussion and documentation forum are available uh, on the uh, table outside. Uh, we have William Rosenau next of the Center for Defense Analyses, and um, I asked, we've asked William to be critical, and uh, we, uh, we look forward to his remarks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, I don't have a formal uh, presentation. I'd like to just make a, a series of, of comments and observations, um, the first of which is uh, the superb quality of, of this book. I mean, I, I, I can't say enough good things about the, the, the police at war. This is a huge contribution to the literature. When I started working on my dissertation in the mid-1990s, um, it was on Vietnam and, and U.S. internal security assistance to Vietnam, I discovered that there actually was no literature. <laughs> not a single monograph, not a single article, a uh, thematic article on the subject of police and counterinsurgency. I think, I think, I think David and Bob have, um, have made a huge contribution in this respect. And uh, as, as Bob Baird suggested uh, as well, I think this is a, a, a very important guide for, for practitioners. So uh, I'm going to be a little bit critical, but uh, I want to begin by saying this, this, is, a, this is a superb work. Um, one of the things I was struck by in the in the commentary this morning really really resonated with me, and it certainly comes out in the book, is this this whole co question of the militarization of, of the police. And um, this, in the context of counterinsurgency, is a absolutely um, perennial problem. We we the U.S. government struggled with this in, in Southeast Asia, has struggled with this in every sort of environment uh, conflict environment in which we tried to train up um, indigenous police forces, and and. Um, the authors uh, are quite right in, in highlighting the, the, the dangers of this um, proclivity. I mean, one of the reasons <laughs> we, we tend to over-militarize these police forces is the people uh, who are doing the police training in, in many situations are our military officers, are our senior enlisted officers. Um, one can't blame them in many respects um, for doing this, but the, the, the dangers are, so, are, are, are self-evident. I mean, only the police can actually do um, police work. Okay. Soldiers, infantrymen can provide security, but only the police can do that kind of core policing that the authors um, talk about. And if we have the police, now th this has been this has been uh, apparent in Iraq, but, but really in Afghanistan, and really recently in Marja, I, I saw a picture a month ago of an Afghan national policeman carrying an RPG yep. in this fight for Marja. And 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 there's something fundamentally wrong with that image. It was it was it was it was startling and it was extremely depressing. I'm not going to go on at any kind of length about the the, f the shortfalls of the ANP, but I am going to come back to it because I think this gets it at, at at the one criticism. It's not really a criticism. I, I I just I have a different approach in some respects to this this question of of, of police roles um, in counterinsurgency, and it really comes down to this for me fundamental question about policing and the state. Okay, I mean, not that many countries. There, there are a lot of countries in the world that have police forces. Okay, and by police, you know, uniformed representatives of the state. But not every country has this. This is our this is our ideal. Okay, when we are training police forces abroad to create these uniformed representatives of the state who will somehow, by their by their good works, by their public spiritedness, by their um, the trust that the public has for them build legitimacy for the state. And I think we've somehow wrapped that up with counterinsurgency in a way that is not always useful okay, or, or, or even necessary. I mean, I think there, there are environments in which, yes, we do want to create a national police force. We do want to have a force that is seen as a representative of the state that performs its duties um, with professionalism, that does those core policing functions, that does that democratic policing that, that, that we, we hold out as an ideal. But I wonder, um, in many parts of the world, and I think the authors, they, they, they hint at this, okay? Outside of the OECD world, this may be, this may be a goal that is simply unachievable, okay? It may, it may be, we have to treat it in, with sort of an aspirational respect. 
But in terms of actually being able to build a police force um, that meets these criteria, that's going to promote legitimacy, I think it may be simply too hard. And I think in places like Afghanistan, we're seeing this, okay? Um, the, the other thing I would mention about this is the notion of I mean, building, building police forces is, is difficult, okay? Building democratic, accountable, professional, effective police forces is, is difficult. We haven't had a lot of success traditionally in doing this, okay? As hard as that is, that is a drop in the bucket in terms of challenge, with respect to challenges, um, compared to building legitimacy. I mean, where have we really been successful, except in a, in a few possible, you know, perhaps Germany, perhaps occupied Japan, in building legitimacy of another state? I mean, that, that to me is, is a goal that is simply, um, is simply too hard to achieve in many situations, okay? And I think we, we, we need to recognize that. What I would propose, it's actually not, certainly not original with me, is um, we, we certainly need, if not police, we need policing, Okay, we need people who are going to provide order in some legitimate way. In some circumstances, that is going to come outside of the state. In fact, in most of the world, that's where it does come from. Okay, in West Africa, in Southeast Asia, okay, in South Asia, Central Asia, customary institutions, local institutions, tribal, non-statutory. Uh, Bruce Baker um, has written, I think, brilliantly on this array of sort of non-statutory security forces in West Africa and how, ranging from neighborhood watch groups, you know, all the way up to paramilitary forces to commercial organizations, okay? And I think, I think those who are engaged in the business of counterinsurgency need to be alert um, to these structures and to, to have a framework for assessing which of these structures, if any, are going to be appropriate um, in the conditions in which they operate. In some circumstances, yes, we may very well decide we absolutely have to build state policing structures. In other circumstances, we may decide, you know what, there's a whole array of sort of, sort of crime and policing that can be dealt with by sort of organic indigenous structures that, you know, which people might not wear uniforms, but which are likely in some circumstances to have a lot lower, more legitimacy and capacity than this made-up force, um, something like the ANP, which, um, just, just to come back to that, to that question, um, I, I, I think, um, and I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I think our experiences um, in Afghanistan, I think have caused some people on the ground, particularly military officers, many of you are familiar with the, the Community Defense Initiative, rechristened the Local Def Defense Initiative, and now I understand it has a new name, Local Security, or something to that effect basically a product of, it's basically militia building, it's basically village self-defense forces. And I think it reflected a frustration on the part of local commanders with the capacity or lack thereof of the AMP and the prospect for building that capacity in any realistic amount of time. So um, that's sort of a dog's breakfast of, um, of comments and observations. Uh, again, I want to congratulate the authors on a, on a, on a truly superb job. Um, I have a, a slightly different approach in, 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 in one area, but um, I think overall this book uh, is, is invaluable, and I urge you all to uh, run out and, and, and get a copy, give it to your friends, put it under the Christmas tree or Hanukkah bush or, or whatever. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you, William. Thank you for reminding us that um, not every place thinks that a uniform cop on the corner is necessarily a good thing. Uh, Mark Sedra, what's okay. the future hold? <laughs> well, that wasn't quite my mandate, but uh, I, I think I will touch on that. But first of all, let, let me put all your minds at ease that this just isn't a U.S. problem, that even in Canada, and I spent the last, I spent eight years uh, living and working in Europe, um, where I was consulting the German and, and British governments on these issues, and they're similarly befuddled with, with many of these challenges. I am also, first I, I'd like to thank USIP and Bob Perito for inviting me here to speak today. Um, I also want to pay tribute to the book, which I think is a, is a fantastic um, uh, contribution to what is in many ways a non-existent literature on this subject. And I think that um, in many ways the challenge that the book puts forth is similar to the for policing and, and in terms of promoting democratic policing in con post-conflict and in, in, in wartime societies, similar to the challenge that faces the wider um, uh, process of security sector reform, which is that, that the principles, the fundamental principles 
of police development are, there's a wide consensus on them, they're well established. But in terms of implementation frameworks, how to actually apply these principles in the field, um, th those frameworks are sorely lacking. Uh, it seems at times that when reformers go into the field, they're operating under the assumption that they're um, in a vacuum, or even worse is that they're in some sort of ideal type environment. So they're applying uh, these principles in many ways in an unrealistic, ahistorical, and acontextual fashion. And if you act in such a way, you can do harm. And I would argue that in Afghanistan, it's not just a matter that the process has failed or that it's faced significant setbacks, but I'd say it's done harm to the society and done harm to prospects for peace building. And I'll uh, elaborate on that as I go on in my talk. And I'm not here talking about intentions and, and about individuals, as it's already been mentioned, because I think the individuals, many of them, have the right intentions, that the programs themselves have the right intentions. The structures are inadequate, and delivery of these aid programs has been a problem. But let's also remember that the complexity of the reforms and the scope of the reforms that we're talking about would be difficult for Western countries, the United States, Canada, European countries, to implement within their own borders, let alone asking some of the poorest countries in the world facing um, debilitating insecurity and poverty to implement these type of reforms within five years or maybe if you're lucky within 10 years. So uh, we have to be realistic. So what is needed? And so here I will look forward to a certain degree. Well, I think we have to do a better job at conceptualizing implementation strategies, implementation strategies suitable to these particularly complex environments. And here's where I particularly pay tribute to this book because I think it does provide a framework in and of itself, talking about curricula and so on, for implementation. I think we have to be modest and realistic. I think that there's been a lack of modesty and realism when we work in these environments. I think that there, we have to understand these local contexts better and actually to contextualize these processes. This is core development principle, that you contextualize um, reforms, that you contextualize aid program, that they should be based on a fundamental understanding of the local society, culture, politics, and history. But tell me where this has really been done effectively in recent memory. We tend to still use templates, Western-oriented templates that we transfer and transpose from one context to the next, and it's not working. Fundamentally, though, and this is the tough part, we have to change the way we do business. The modus operandi just will not cut it anymore. And particularly, this gets to time frames, which has come up um, by, in the, talk, the remarks of several of the presenters. You can't do this in five years. You can't even do it in ten. So when, when, um, when William talked about realistic time frames, well, the realistic time frame is almost generational. And the reality is, is that if you want to promote effective police, if you want to create community policing structures, you, your, your commitments are going to have to have some staying power. Finally, in terms of moving forward, I'll borrow uh, an idea that was presented in a paper by uh, Andrew Rathmel, formerly of RAND and now of the Libra Advisory Group, who said that there's a need to professionalize um, security sector reform. And I would add to this, of course, police reform, which is an aspect of security sector reform. What he means by professionalize is to create a new cadre of experts, not just policing experts per se, but experts who can apply these policing principles, frameworks, and curricula in these complex post-conflict, complex conflict societies. It's about creating the right structures. And the book and its recommendations um, give several examples of structures that can be created. And there are, are some, I understand, already in the United States, such as the Civilian Reserve Corps which I think is a real step forward and a model that can be emulated by the rest of the world if it is to be successful. Let me say a few words about what went wrong in Afghanistan because I think that even though Afghanistan, it's one case, it's a particularly complex case, I think it's still telling some of the things that did go wrong. First of all, there were two lost years in the process, the first two years of the process, 2002 and 2003. There was no strategy. 
up until 2007, 2008, there was no one framework or document you could point to that says there. That's how police reform is being undertaken. That's how um, these are the fundamental guidelines for the process. There was no consensus. There was no consensus among the donors, and there was no consensus among the different security agencies within the Afghan government. And in, in essence, what happened is the police, the keys for the police were handed over to strong men and warlords. And this is what I mean when I talk about very severe harm that has been done to the process. The second problem is coordination. So early on in the process, there were two main actors, Germany and the United States. And I would say that coordination was extremely poor. I can tell you that I did a lot of field work in 2003, 2004, and 2005. And I often felt like I was a shuttle diplomat going back and forth from the US Embassy to the German police program because I was passing on messages. They had no idea what each other were doing for the most part. In one, in, in one really telling example is that the, I was told, this is what the Germans told me, that the United States at the time in 2004 wasn't even sharing its curriculum for its regional training centers to the German police program. Perhaps from what David said, maybe there was no curriculum. I don't know. But, uh, but, this is, but certainly this was a problem and that there was some real underlying tension there. Now, much of this has been addressed over time and now through things like cross-appointments, um, through things like uh, the International Police Coordination Boards or coordination structures, you've dealt with some of these problems. Perhaps the biggest reason is now that there's one overwhelming player, and that's the U.S. So when there's one big player, coordination becomes less of a problem. The third issue is resources. In the beginning of the process, there wasn't enough resources. Okay, The Germans really didn't have the ambition or the inclination to reform an entire national police and really just focused on the upper echelons of the police. There has always in the process been lacking human resources. So I mean mentors in the field, trainers at headquarters, and so on. But I would say that in the last few years, there's almost been too much resources. Now, what do I mean by too much? Because when you have a, a, a force that faces such huge debilitating gaps, how could there be too much resources? Well, there just isn't the structures to absorb these resources. And that's why you see equipment going missing en masse. And I have so many anecdotes. I could turn, you know, you'd turn green uh, mm -hmm. if I could, started to recite them here. Really disturbing stuff about how the wastage of resources I think also when we talk about resources, we have to talk about contracting of private security and private military companies. I think that they are a fact on the ground. They're needed in many respects because they provide resources that aren't available within states and within governments. But I think that there has to be an understanding of the need to systematize this process, systematize um, uh, collaboration and working uh, level contacts with these organizations. Fourthly, and I just have two more here, is the militarization of this process. And I won't belabor this point because it's been addressed. But there has been a, a serious militarization of the Afghan National Police. And I think, I absolutely, one of the things I enjoy most about this book is this concept of core policing, of responsiveness, of availability, and even handedness or fairness. I can tell you that if you were able to achieve that in the Afghan National Police, that would be such a mate. You can forget about all of the technical requirements. That would be such a major step forward for the legitimacy of the state and peace building within Afghanistan. But the focus really has been to prepare the Afghan police to serve as another cog in the counterinsurgency machine and to relieve pressure on coalition forces. And that simply, of course, has not worked, as we've seen. Now, I think that you also have to understand that there are different branches of the police. Some branches of the police can have a more counterinsurgency role, like uh, the Afghan National Civil Order Police, which has been one of the most successful branches of the police, as receives more advanced training, counterinsurgency, and combat training. However, that doesn't mean you ignore the community police, because they are the main actor who is interacting with the Afghan population at the local grassroots level. They do establish the legitimacy of the state. Finally, um, I think there's been the problem of quick fixes. And this was mentioned in the last presentation in terms of reliance on non-state actors, reliance on um, militia actors. 
Now, in and of itself, I'm supportive of looking to traditional security and justice structures where they're appropriate, where they are actually indigenous in many of these societies. In rural areas of Afghanistan, the main contact you have with the state is through the local police. So if you don't do the police right, you are undermining the legitimacy of the entire state building process. And if you look at this, an example it was in Marja recently after the offensive from what media reports say that the Marines were welcomed in by tribal elders after the combat. But, you know, they clearly said one thing. Take the police away. We don't want them back. So I think that in and of itself is very telling. So what are some of the broader conclusions that we can draw on this? Well, number one, there's no shortcuts to the police, unfortunately. That this is a long-term approach requiring long-term investment of resources. And you can't get around that in any way. That we also need new structures in place to actually facilitate the type of framework that is being emphasized um, here within the book, The Police at War. We need a more clearly defined model and new resolve to implement these structures. And I would say, just as a final remark, that if you're not willing to make those type of commitments, if you're not willing to do the work in terms of changing the way we do business, establishing the necessary institutional coordination structures, it's actually better not to get involved in these cases at all and to stay on the sidelines because you can do harm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you to the entire panel. We have a room full of people who are experienced in this matter or who have some responsibility for it now uh, and a great deal of interest in it. So I'm going to invite people to come up to the uh, microphones to uh, ask questions or make comments. Uh, Mark has... Uh, Mark has challenged us in a way about the future. Uh, let me throw in a first question. Uh, can we meet that challenge? Uh, David, Bob, uh, I invite you to outline maybe briefly the institutional changes that you suggest in the book. You. <laughs> At the same time, I invite people to come up yeah. to the microphones uh, to uh, comment. And you have to come up and speak because otherwise they just keep asking us questions and keep putting us on the spot. He really is very good at this stuff. And, um, but, you know, in, in Afghanistan, we're, we're at a point, I think, now where, where finally uh, rationality is beginning to dawn. But to give you the level of the problem, i just quote you two facts. Up until very recently, the, um, the sequencing of the, for the Afghan National Police was, was recruit, deploy, and then train. <laughs> Only in the last few months has the, the Ministry of the Interior and all of the participating uh, powers gotten together and agreed that now the sequencing will be recruit, train, and then deploy. And we're going to stop the practice of bringing in Afghan youth off the streets, giving them a badge, a gun, and a uniform, and then putting them out there, and then sometime later trying to round them up and bring them back and, and try to teach them what they should be doing. So that's, that's, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that a year ago, the United Nations said there were 78,000 police officers in the Afghan National Police. A few weeks ago, a, um, a, a State Department, no, a Defense Department senior official said there were 102,000 um, members of the Afghan National Police. And then he went on to say that our goal for next year was 134,000 Afghan National Police. There is no way that an institution can grow at that rate uh, without serious, well, anyway, there's no way that an institution can grow at that rate. You know, and, and that's, that's sort of the environment in which we're trying to operate. I think what, what David and I are proposing is a, a consolidation and a recognition of, uh, first of all, a recognition, and secondly, a consolidation of the problem that we face in a place like Afghanistan, where you have a, a, uh, a police force that's, that's new to the job, that's largely illiterate, and where attitudes are much more important than skills. 
and where you're teaching people who have maybe never been in a classroom before, and where it's very hard to to communicate, um, you know, technical police skills. But attitudes can be communicated, and if we can do that, we will have overcome, you know, uh, we will have accomplished a major adjustment. If if Af if the citizens of Afghanistan thought to tell their children that, you know, if you have a problem, go talk to the police officer, that would be an enormous change and one that would, I think, help us win the war. David, you want to pick up? Uh, let me just say this, and, and, and I, I'm kind of reluctant to do it, but I am going to say it. You know, are we likely to succeed in standing up legitimate governments in the places in most of the world that needs them? No, we're not. Uh, and, and it comes ultimately to the, the, the willingness of the international community, of which America is a, an important part, to commit to the long haul. And so, in other words, Bob and I are saying some things that have to be done if you're interested in the long haul. If I were to, to, to kind of bet, is that going to happen? Are we going to have the political commitment in, the, in, the, in our world to do that in the long haul? I would have to bet against it. Uh, nonetheless, we're there. We have to start the process, and we have to start it right. So I don't think there's any other alternative than to start to do it right. The long-haul project projection of success, I think, is probably realistically pretty bleak. Please introduce I'm, yourself. Please. I'm Chip Stewart, the uh, senior fellow at CNA, a, a think tank uh, for law enforcement. And... Uh, I've been a fan of the efforts that have been underway by the authors of this book. I've had a chance to sponsor David on a number of projects when I was director of the National Institute of Justice for 10 years. And one of the things that strikes me that the charge of this panel has and people in this room is that, and I think Lieutenant Baird covered, Lieutenant Colonel Baird covered this very, very well, where he talked about irregular warfare and how we have actually evolved into a sort of a different sort of state. And our decision to enter into this, it seems to me to be never informed by the principal reason of how do we get an exit strategy? What does an end state look like? And I would suggest that maybe we would start with some of the premises in the book that's been advanced as a goal of the end state so that the resources planning and development is seen as a series of efforts evolutionary in which there would be a stabilization and a bubble created a sense of in the, before we go in to do the analysis and intelligence development about who could be police people courts people and corrections people and what kinds of sort of technologies could be used to support an illiterate population? And I suggest there are several on the market today. There has not been a, a confluence of this kind of thinking. And uh, my question is, basically, is that why is it that we don't fit, 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 uh, factor in when we're talking about rule of law that we ought to have a police backed up by courts and corrections that are records-based? I mean, that's not part of the going in. I don't think that's a commander's intent, in, in my impression, that when you get directions to, to occupy a country, that this is part of it, where it was with Japan and Germany, I think. Lieutenant Colonel, I think this is in part a uh, question for the military side. I think I covered briefly that uh, police development is not considered a general purpose force mission because of laws. I think... I think our nation, of which the military is a reflection of, believes that we should not have a militarized police force for our history shows and our the birth of the nation has a distinct separation of the military does this and police and domestic agencies do that. So we're left with a gap in capabilities. Were we to create an organization, whether it be a civilian organization, a commission organization, what have you, that would train and deploy with the, with the conventional general purpose forces, it would allow for an appreciation on both sides in bringing it together. Because we put a firewall up of these regulations, <clears throat> they're, they're by exception. 
by exception, makes it very difficult. For example, okay, I'm going to take an infantry officer and make me a rule of law officer. Okay, what does that look like? What's his career development? Will he get promoted? Will he not get promoted? So I, I, if someone said create this tomorrow, it's, it's not within the current construct of what military forces are perceived by our nation and the people in the nation is what we do. So that leaves us with, okay, we contract it. I believe that the contracting solution, while short-term and important and maybe very qualified people, is a legitimacy issue of not being government people representing the United States. They're contracted to represent, but there's a, there's a significant challenge there. They're brave men and women. They're out there doing it, and they're very, they believe in the mission. And a lot of them are former military that then go back. So there's a lot of good people doing that. It's just responsibilities, government responsibilities, if we foresee that. Mark, did you want to comment on this from the civilian side? Yeah, no, I mean, I, absolutely. I think In, I'm, into yeah. the microphone, please. I think that's one of the big problems, is not envisioning this from the beginning. I know that... In Afghanistan, if you look at some of the early documentation um, surrounding, you know, the division of responsibilities for security sector reform, there was almost a naive assumption that the security situation would sort itself out. And the reality was the problem with also creating that division of labor in the beginning was that there wasn't any consideration for the level of resources each actor to, could bring to the table or the expertise. So the United States took control of the army and were willing to invest quite a bit of, ex, uh, of money and human resources into the process. The Germans just didn't have those type of resources available. I mean, that's talking about one particular case. But in none of the cases that I've looked at and will continue to look at is policing considered you know, a key aspect from the very beginning. And in the context of state building, I can think of perhaps no more important actor, no more important process. We talk often that you need security first before you can do development and build institutions. And you need to build the legitimacy, as has been often said, of the state uh, in order to move forward with institution building and democratization and so on. And the police is such a key actor in doing this. And so I, I would agree with the premise of your question, absolutely. Please. Hi, Julie Warble from USAID. Thank you to USIP and to the to panelists, and thank you particularly to um, Bob and, and David for continuing to push our thinking on, on policing. Uh, first, a quick comment and then a question. I'd very much like to see the dialogue evolve from police training to police development. Training is only the solution when the problem is a lack of knowledge or a lack of skills. And when you talk about really public administrative reform of the police, there are multiple other areas that need to be addressed, including the institutional capacity of the organization, the policy and legal framework, and the overall environment in which police uh, development occurs. The question uh, is really that, as you all know, we're conducting a number of internal reviews right now within the U.S. government looking very closely at, at this question. Uh, and I'd like to ask each of you for your top recommendation on what we should be thinking about in terms of rethinking how we deliver civilian police assistance. And I might note that Julie is a leader in this area of security sector reform, so uh, suggestions you make uh, may actually be used. <laughs> Can't promise. Uh, shall we? Uh, yeah, we propose something. Bob, you do it. Please. No, go ahead. No, no. I, I don't know what you're thinking about. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the last chapter. <laughs> oh, okay. We can talk about the last chapter. Yeah. Um, actually, we should rat Julia out because she's been enormously helpful to uh, to USIP to the uh, to the program that I run here, and is is, uh, is a wonderful person, and we're so grateful that she's here this morning. Um, you know, in the final chapter of the book, we we talk about the um, the changes that would be useful in the United States government if we wanted to do police reform. Uh, and if we want to do security sector reform, you know, in a more serious way. Um, we have enormous dark holes in the U.S. government uh, structure. We don't have a national police force. We don't have a, um, a, minis or a, a Department of the Interior that actually looks at these kinds of issues. Um, and we don't have a lot of um, expertise, and then we don't utilize effectively the expertise that we have. And we've made a recommendation in the book that it would be very helpful to create an agency in the U.S. government, probably at the level of the executive office of the president, 
that would bring together all of the talented people who do this kind of work and who want to do this kind of work and then give that agency the responsibility um, and the authority and the congressional support and the funding to actually carry this off. Um, this is a recommendation that's not unique with our book. It's been made by, by a number of other people, and I could quote you the list. Um, but absent that, we're left in a circumstance now where we're trying to patch together. And uh, one, of the, um, one of the roles of, of the initiative that I had here at USIP is to try to offer some suggestions about how this can be done. But there are other views on this on the panel, I'm sure. Uh, and other thoughts may be for Julie. Please, Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, I, in Al Anbar, I struggled with coordinating and synchronizing such development things like building of the police stations. Okay, and so there was a fascinating dialogue of, okay, when do you build a police station and have the policemen there and have coalition security there and have it all synchronized? So I would, I would recommend we do at a tactical level synchronization. I believe some of that's happening in the PRTs. But what I think my real point is that I would recommend is we don't perceive as some handoff, like I have police development, then you have police development, then I get it when it goes bad, and then that we have to get as a government as it needs to move in the realm of conflict prevention, that it needs to go ahead of collapse. Why? Because these international terrorists, al-Qaeda, whomever, are going to be in these countries. We need them to be, these other countries, to build their capacity, which USAID is tremendous at doing. And so an organization to build the capacity for security cooperation before conflict, so we're not picking up the pieces, we've prevented the security declines. So this organization shouldn't just be response, oh, it's all broken, now we've got to fix it. Let's prevent that collapse and make it a cooperative effort and, and engage, the problem is the government responds. It isn't necessarily good at proactively doing it. But that'd be my recommendation. I can certainly talk to you. William about Rosina? Um, <clears throat> a couple of things. Um, almost 50 years ago, 5 0, uh, in the early days of the Kennedy administration, there was a debate in the U.S. government on this exact question who should have responsibility for training police forces overseas? And some, there's some fascinating declassified documents. The, this debate went back and forth. Well, we should give it to the CIA. Well, the CIA, now it's too overt. The CIA shouldn't be doing it. We should give it to the military. Blowtorch Bob Comer, um, former uh, RAND employee, came up with it. He said, no, 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 we don't want to give it to a bunch of colonels. They're going to run around and create all these armies. We decided to keep it where it was, which was in AID, the Office of Public Safety. And I would... The Office of Public Safety, which basically ended in the mid-1970s after these revelations about supposed training of, of torturers and foreign police forces and in a sort of a post-Watergate backlash against uh, U.S. foreign policy in general, it, it, it was eliminated. And I, I, I did a little work looking at this uh, AID and its predecessor organizations and their police training in the 50s and the 60s, and I, I think a lot of it was really good. And I think there was an argument to be made for AID doing this work because of that development link, okay? Very, very important. And I would, I would um, I wonder whether it might be worth um, looking back and looking at that experience with the Office of Public Safety and really doing an assessment of its, of its capabilities and performance over time and look at this question about, about AID actually, actually doing this um, in-house, having this responsibility for it. Um, the other thing I'd mention, and I, I, I just I, I touched on it in my in my comments, um, wondering about the ability of the U.S. government to identify and engage with these non-statutory groups that I uh, that I discussed. Okay, these customary structures, tribal structures, um, Sharia courts, this whole apparatus, this rich array um, across the developing world of, of security providers, some with more and some with less legitimacy. <coughs> And wondering whether the U.S. government really has any ability to engage with those groups, to identify those groups, to work with those groups, and where appropriate to promote security at that at that level. So that that, that those would be my my comments. Mark, yeah. did you want to answer? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I would agree. I think everyone here is that I think you have to have an institution within the government that has ownership 
over security sector reform and particularly police training. I won't. It's been it's been discussed. I mean, we face that within Canadian government. There's uh, you know a lot of infighting over who has uh, who should be controlling the resources and who should be directing the process. Uh, but there has seems to me like as a a structure that also can develop an institutional memory. Uh, which is often, we seem to be starting over every time we launch an SSR process in some ways. Um, I, I think that one thing that's also been mentioned is, and, and when I say this, I'm referring more also at the international level as well as the U.S., to have almost this idea of creating a civilian expert core. Uh, you know, being able to deploy civilian assets, including police trainers, to the field quickly is one of the biggest problems. So as a, as a solution to that, contractors have been relied upon. But even there, there's been some issues uh, surrounding, in, in some cases, quality and transparency and accountability. Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, various countries, including the United States, are looking at ways to establish these types of systems. Um, but I think over the long term, that's key. I, I, I concur absolutely with the idea about traditional structures. My institution, we're having a workshop looking at this, at the intersection between security sector reform and traditional structures, justice and security later this year because we see it as, as really critical. And there's people doing fantastic work about that in the United States. I think it's many scholars who are doing excellent work on that, USIP being one of the key ones in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Um, finally, um, I think this focus, there has to be renewed focus on oversight. Because that's the governance aspect, funny enough, security sector reform is a concept. The innovation of it was to focus on governance, not just train and equip. And yet, that seems to still be the odd man out. There's this idea that, well, that's we can do that later once the security situation is stabilized. But if you want really to promote core policing, if you want to promote honesty, fairness, and so on, you also have to be, there, there has to be some oversight to ensure that that's being applied successfully and that there are consequences for things like corruption and when uh, impunity. So I think that more of an emphasis within SSR and actually establishing these oversight accountability mechanisms. And we're not talking about anything, I'm not talking about pie in the sky, things very sophisticated ones, um, uh, you know, on the basis, but, but in some cases just core oversight structures. Thanks. Thank you. David, did you want to add anything? I would note that uh, USIP has done a yeah, lot of absolutely. case studies on informal justice systems. We, we haven't quite decided what to call them, to tell you the yeah. truth. Uh, the term legal pluralism has entered our lexicon. <laughs> it's one that troubles me a little bit. But I would note that we are building up to the publication of a rather thick volume of case studies of this sort. Please. Uh, Good morning. Uh, my name is Walter Redman. I'm the senior police advisor for the Department of State uh, Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, the INL Bureau, which has the ultimate responsibility on behalf of the U.S. government, civilian components for the development and training of um, uh, the uh, or implementing the international uh, training programs. Interesting uh, point. And again, thank you to USIP for, as always, putting on uh, uh, extremely uh, valid and timely uh, subject uh, and, uh, and, and discussion points. Bob Perito. Uh, uh, when I, I saw Bob this morning, his uh, commentary to me was he first initially thought that the State Department would be picketing outside uh, <laughs> versus participating here. Uh, Bob, let me assure you that, that after listening to the presentations and, of course, uh, the opportunity to hear and, of course, knowing uh, uh, David Bailey, uh, uh, the pickets were put away. And, and <laughs> we, we sent the message down, hey, go put the pickets away. We're, we're absolutely good. But... Uh, and, and again, quite frankly, your, your subject matter, as you've looked at lessons learned, where we went wrong, your, your tasks were almost like shooting fish in a barrel as it pertains to Iraq and Afghanistan, clearly. But your points were obviously uh, uh, well thought and, and, and quite valid as we, we look and continually review our process. We have been caught up in the fierce urgency of now in responding to these requirements that have been placed upon us uh, in working with our military, clearly. Uh, I think that uh, we, especially those of us on the civilian side, have acknowledged the, the, the over-militarization of these programs as our militaries had the role as we are serving in a war zone, as our training programs are akin to and linked to the operational concerns on the, in the field, you know, as far as the requirements for personnel. That, in turn, does not match up with what David Bailey's points were with the development of a civilian force. Absolutely correct. And it's, and it's that very, very significant and very, very careful balance of moving into the role of police primacy and the role. I would remind you that as you judge a law enforcement or a police agency, 
which is a constantly moving, even in the United States, as we learn every day. You know, um, there there are, are parents not far from here who don't send their children <laughs> directly to the police for help. So that occurs. But the difference is Chief Lanier and her staff work hard every day at changing that. And again, those are some of the components that, that we hope to instill. Um, I also have to acknowledge that I am one of the individuals. Now, I didn't throw anything off a truck. But, <laughs> you know, but, but I am one of the individuals that David Bailey called two years ago uh, as I, I left Iraq. I spent almost four years in Iraq working and developing the program uh, with, along with our military colleagues. Um, and David Bailey called and asked for, hey, Walter, I want, can we see the curriculum? What are you doing? What's the consistency? And I assured Dr. Bailey that the curriculum exists. It's there. Uh, I couldn't find it. I, I didn't know exactly where it was. I couldn't put my hand on it. But I, I asked them to trust me. It, it's, it's there. You know, I mean, we're training it. People are there. They're doing it. Very smart folks. You know, but one reality existed. As we went into Iraq and we started pushing the program more into 2004, and, and we looked at curriculum that was recycled from Bosnia and Kosovo and so forth. And a lot of it is cut and pasted. And every now and then they'll, they'll miss one of the deals and you'll see a Kosovo. Like a, you know, <laughs> that, but okay. Um, you know, the one thing that we acknowledged that very early on was pushing that to the side. And let me say that I sit here today with colleagues from state aid, justice, you know, that did, you know, put it on the line in service to their country. So yeah, as well as uh, alongside our military colleagues. But I will say this, as we, as we moved that curriculum to the side and, and did work with, as we were doing some of the first management courses in Iraq, the one benefit, the one thing that we were able to accomplish was at least getting the Iraqi police officials to acknowledge that they owed a debt to their communities, that the service that they previously gave was clearly inadequate and not worthy of a true policeman. And when we sit with them, and we always use the phrase democratic policing, in Iraq, we learned, and Rick Hatler will remind you of this, that we started coining a phrase to our Iraqi colleagues that, you know what, it's easy being the police in a police state. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, the, it's that the challenge of policing in a democracy that continues on and on that is a never-ending role and responsibility. And it's a key responsibility and one that officers must be held accountable for. So, but uh, my, my time here is really to assure you that the State Department today has seen that and has acknowledged it, and, has been, and, and we're the ones that take, clearly take the beating for you know, anything that has occurred in, in the movement. You know, we have missions that, that are on the oversight that are funded through DOD, but it's an interesting role that the state will be the one pointed at. Well, by the way, state and DynCorp, you guys are the ones that messed up on this. Now, when DynCorp ever had the responsibility for running a mission, please let me know when that occurs. You know, so we can actually step in and stop that. But the reality <laughs> exists. The reality exists that we do have a role and we have a responsibility, and we're all part of this. And we're not pointing fingers here. But I do find it interesting that in a role that is directed, it's not just militarized; it's run by the military. You know, and and but we are a clear partner and a supportive, and must be that way, hands down. And in how we do the transition, and we are in the process in Iraq today of transitioning the program from DOD to DOS. But I like to, to say it's not DOD to DOS, it's from the U.S. government to the government of Iraq because the, the role is really empowering the host nation. And then what the democracy looks like, who's to say? It's not really, and it's not for us to say because democracy will vary and it'll, it'll, it'll change and it'll morph. But anyway, my goal here to, this, to, to at least assure you that the concept of developing a significant doctrine is clearly in place, that our, our, our superiors have clearly come now to us and said, well, hey, you know, that must be in place. State Department has to have that role and has clearly looked at, at creating that in, in, in bringing more. I'm a, I'm a law enforcement professional. That's where I come from. And my role today is trying to do that within an international context. Anyway, thank you very much. Let me thank you for that. And to reiterate what I said before, which is our profound appreciation for the people who do this work and for the challenges that they face. Bob? Yeah, just one small comment. Um, Walt, obviously, is an old friend. Uh, and besides being a, a really extremely good fellow with a great sense of humor, um, he's also a, a unique. Um, Walt is one of the very, very few, and it, there was a time not too long ago when he was the only uh, career law enforcement professional in INL at the State Department. Um, you know, 
And, and this, is, this is part of the problem. I think what the State Department needs is needs more Waltz, guys who are career law enforcement professionals with extensive experience in Iraq and Afghanistan and other uh, difficult places. I mean, we, we, we really need to, at a minimum, professionalize this work um, and, and turn it over to people who know what they're doing. And so that's um, you know, just, a, just a point I want to make here before we move on. Um, please. Marisa. Marie Salino from Northrop Grumman. Um, a couple of the speakers have touched on the importance of local buy-in, and certainly uh, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I think only um, – I'm sorry, I can't read it from here, from here. My eyes are bad. The second, the second from the end, yes. Sorry. William, Rose William Rose Yeah, I think you were the only one who mentioned tribal politics – and I would like to ask the question. It was sparked by uh, the mention that uh, the, the locals asked the, the, our military to get rid of the police in Marja. Uh, I'd like to ask the question because I gather that there has been some relative greater success in training Afghan army than in Afghan police for whatever complex reasons whether it's an issue of tribal politics um, that uh, the police were asked, they were asked to uh, remove the police in, F in Marja or whether it was a question of corruption or both. And uh, perhaps more broadly, uh, looking at Iraq and Afghanistan, the issue of how tribal politics comes into play when training police because you can't necessarily put a Shia policeman in a Sunni area or uh, a Pashtun uh, policeman in a Tajik area, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I haven't heard much on this aspect of the training. Thank you. William. Okay, yeah. um, ju just a couple of words. I'm sure there are people in this audience who know a lot more about um, Afghan tribal politics than I do. But a couple of things. I mean, with, with the ANA, the Afghan National Army, um, I, I think it's generally touted as something of a success, and I think one of the reasons it has been a success, to the extent it has, is because of the, the, the kind of the care and feeding, the infinite care and feeding that we devoted to the ANA relative to the police. I mean, and from, from the beginning, okay? I mean, these guys, they lived on the forward operating bases. They had plenty of ammunition. They were fed. They were housed. They were, you know, our forces were embedded with them. That's only just beginning to happen with the ANP. So there's something to be said for having basically, uh, I mean, looking at the caliber of our, um, uh, at, uh, the people who are advising the ANA, um, you know, superb Marines and, and, um, and, 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 and Army um, senior NCOs and, and, and officers, we really gave that it, it, its all. We've only just begun to do a similar, take a similar approach as, 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 um, as Mark mentioned. I mean, it's really only been in the last year or two where we've taken a similar approach with the AMP. Um, you know, as far as the tribal politics in Iraq um, and policing, I think Bob, I'm going to turn the spotlight on you, Bob. You could probably <laughs> answer that much better than I can. I mean, I think I will say this. Um, you, 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 you talked about, you know, beyond the tribal differences, the, you know, various ethnic, uh, ethno-linguistic differences and so on, which are myriad in, in Afghanistan. This has really been a challenge with policing because, I mean, you have, you have literally, you know, Dari speakers serving in districts in which, you know, the vast majority of the population speaks Pashto. So what, what do you do about that? And one of the arguments is, well, we need to bring in these outside people. There's, a, there's an advantage to bringing in these outside people because they're just not caught up in the tribal games. They're not caught up in the corruption. They're not caught up with this, you know, inane feuds and so on. Um, but, of course, the problem is they don't know anything, right? If you were not from that district or sub-district or valley, your ability to have that kind of understanding that, you know, people who are doing core policing really need to have is, is, is extremely remote. Um, Moreover, uh, these outsiders who were brought in, and this is this is this is uh, I find this deeply depressing. Um, these outsiders who were brought in are in turn often corrupted. Okay, they, they they find themselves after a few months. Even even the Afghan civil order police, which are again you know a hand reared, you know uh, free range hand reared <laughs> uh, force. Um, you, you've seen in a number of districts in, in, in Helmand and in Helmand and other places, you've seen them corrupted during the focus district development process where they come in and replace the, the, the district police for six or eight weeks. 
after a month, I've talked to marine mentors and, and others who said, oh, ANCOP, they got corrupted. So this inside-outside dynamic in a place like um, Afghanistan, it's, it's just, it's, 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 it's really daunting, and I, I don't have a good answer, and I'm not sure I've answered your question. Can, can I just give a very, very Please, brief, one, the ANA versus the AMP, one of the big differences, the ANA were built from scratch. They said, we're not dealing with any old systems. They uh, established criteria for entering the ANA that would dissuade many of the uh, former militiamen from entering. The police, they said, we're going to work with existing police, which were the militias, the Northern Alliance militias. So that's where you the, the problems from the beginning, many of them stem. So I just wanted to say that. <clears throat> Just quickly, um, I think the ANA is not regionalized or localized, s similar to the uh, Iraqi army. So you would have an army force that was brought from a mixture in a different region. Not so with the police forces who were locally recruited and then locally stationed. So guess what? Locally intimidated, locally murdered, locally have families, locally not above anything we would face in this country if any, but any law enforcement professional's family was targeted. So I think we have to not take a higher ground and look at that. I think when we use the term tribal, I don't think it's necessarily, um, we need to really look at these as communities. And it's, again, not long. We have communities, they need security, they elect sheriffs, those sheriffs get deputies, they provide security. So I think if we look at it in that construct, but there is a overwhelming, the feedback I've gotten personally is that you, it is not acceptable to have a tribal organization turned into a police force, that it has to be done anew. And that's very, uh, you talk about legitimacy, I just said communities elect leaders who have security, that makes it then illegitimate, which doesn't get the right people, doesn't have the backing, and makes it difficult. So it's, it's, a, it's a corundum between the two. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Dan. I'm Will Embry. Uh, uh, I spent a long time in the State Department working on post-conflict uh, stabilization, reconstruction, and my real interest was that transition from from uh, a soldier military-led security to a civilian-led uh, uh, security and the challenges are there. Uh, obviously, the conversation has been pushed by the fierce you know, urgency of now to, to Afghanistan, but it's uh, not just uh, Afghanistan we're worried about. I now work for DynCorp International, and I must say it's absolutely fascinating moving from being in the policy-making side of the world to being in the implementing side of the world. I just thought I'd make a comment on what it looks like from the contractor's side uh, viewpoint. In Afghanistan, it's really very balkanized. Who it is that uh, that we are working for, uh, as uh, as Walter said, uh, you know the contractors do what they're told by the government, and in this case, uh, INL is really uh, told by uh, DoD what the policy is. The question is, do do soldiers make good uh, uh, good cops? And I think the question that every one of you touched on before is, are the police in Afghanistan supposed to be little soldiers, or are they supposed to be setting up democratic policing? Well, if you're an EMT specialist, you come to a, uh, a car crash and there's somebody with a broken leg, do you set the broken leg or do you just make sure he's breathing first? And I think that's DOD's approach in this, is that we've got to make sure that the country survives and therefore any resources we've got to try to help with the counterinsurgency is, uh, is really the place to start from. Uh, but on the other hand, the long-term health of the country, the legitimacy of the government depends on having real policemen doing the things that David, uh, I think, laid out has to be done for, for, the, for the police. Uh, but let me just step back a minute. Uh, I did a lot of work with the UN peacekeeping, and my question is, nobody here has mentioned UN or UN civilian policing uh, today. I wondered if you might comment on why you haven't. Bob. Yeah, um, Professor Bailey and I belong to a, a, a small group of advisors that the UN has called together um, to advise them on um, UN policing and the future of, of UN police forces. We met recently uh, in Turin, Italy, and we're about to reconvene again um, in New York. Um, I was asked to chair one of the um, panels um, on what they called robust policing. 
and um, I believe in constabulary. Gendarmeries have written a book on the subject, and so I very forcefully made a presentation uh, about how the UN should get into this business, and um, there were people turning white around the room. Uh, the UN really does not see itself um, as a counterinsurgency force. They don't see UN uh, military and police forces engaging in counterinsurgency. Uh, the UN sees itself as, as a peacekeeping entity, and that means there has to be a peace first keep. Uh, and so the way the UN is, is looking at UN policing right now is how to develop a force that can operate in, a, in an environment where peace has been established, and then you're implementing that peace process. Um, I don't know if David would agree. Well, let me have a, just add another point. Uh, I, I think that uh, the UN confronts exactly the same problem in its peacekeeping of, of modulating and, and working together its, it, the, the military part and the civilian development. And I'll simply say this, with respect to police development and training, it has no doctrine at all that you can you know, go to a, a, a piece of paper and look at it and say this is, this is the way policing is, this is our vision of policing and this is the way you train for it. It simply doesn't exist. And I went to another of those places where I called up, like I called up Walt, and said, tell me how you've been doing training over the past period of time back into the 90s, and they were unable to produce it. Uh, now, it is complicated even more in the UN case, of course, because you've got uh, policing traditions from a variety of countries, and to homogenize those is one hell of a problem. I mean, at least in the United States, we do have, know how to do what we call full-service policing in the United States. And if we can draw on that expertise from state and local agencies, we will be well ahead of the game. So we don't have a, a homogenization problem so much in the United States. We have a decision about how we're, how we're going to use police at all. But I think we do know how to do full-service policing in a democratic society. And the UN has is a long way from figuring this out. I would just note that... Uh there's another entity we haven't mentioned, which is the EU, uh, which has been particularly active in the area of policing and I think has quite a bit to offer uh, more in some respects than the UN does. And, and, and Dan, they're at, the, they're at the doctrine creation period right now. Please. Good morning. Gary Barr, the United States Department of Justice, ISITAP. I'd like to, to share one or two observations and ask a question to the panel. First of all, Mr. Rosenau, I need to uh, thank you very much for pointing out that police should be training police. Police practitioners are the best qualified. I know that, uh, in my opinion, in a number of situations because of expediency and convenience that the military has been placed in a very awkward position. Professionals like Colonel Barrett have been, been asked to train police, and they were ill-equipped and not prepared to do that. It would be akin to asking the average police officer to train military people in small unit tactics or infantry tactics. That's not, that's not what police do. Why, why would the military be able to step up and do that? It's not, it's not logical. Uh, the second observation I wanted to make was, uh, Dr. Bailey and Mr. Frito, your core concept uh, on curricula I couldn't agree with more. As a uh, career law enforcement professional, those are things, in my opinion, that really need to be there. In order to have a, a functional police organization, those core basics are an absolute requirement. The, um, the uh, situation with uh, attempting to address uh, a problem while you're in a, um, a war zone and not putting the fundamentals down, not being able to get the people trained in those basics. We're trying to, to for expediency's sake, move a force ahead and I've heard so many times about the curricula being being shortened. We need to get bodies on the street. We need to get the military relieved. The military has to move on. That's understandable. Uh, in your book, you talk about Kosovo as a five-week training uh, program. Those five weeks uh, were the, the shortened version to meet a number of political demands, uh, funding uh, concerns. But in reality, uh, there was a graduation. There was a big ceremony. Everyone came and we finished a five-week training program, and then we took them right back and put them back in class again. There was no way those people were trained and able to take the street and do their job. So my question is, you make some very good points about uh, how we should fix this. What's your prognosis in getting all the people together, not only police practitioners, but the international community to recognize these needs and be able to come together on, uh, and to develop 
uh, way forward. Bob. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I have to, to say for starters that um, um, I at least didn't think up these ideas that are in the book uh, on my own. I learned them from police practitioners like Gary. Um, I was at ICTAP mm -hmm. as well, and, and uh, Gary and, and people like him who've uh, made their careers in this area are really good teachers, and they've seen this stuff in the field and, and sort of taught it to us. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, you know, the, the whole the whole business about how much time you take, I just make a point about the, the situation in Afghanistan. Um, the um, Focus District Development Training Program, that's our core U.S. training program in Afghanistan, was eight weeks. It's just been shortened to six weeks. Uh, the way you get to this 134,000 figure that I, that I talked about earlier is you give actually less training and you do it faster uh, and you produce less qualified people and you, you know, all right. Um, so I'll stop and turn this over to somebody else in the panel. No, I, I think uh, my point, and I think I just briefly made it, but it's about how do we measure success? Your point about getting them back in, are they capable? Can they perform in the environment they're placed in? Uh, very well stated about um, roles and missions and even ethos of organizations that are involved in this. You, 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 you can't change. You might be able to change training structures or curricula, but to change the ethos of an organization to do things that it is not believe it is to do, that's very hard. And, by the way, changing that country's Organizations to change their ethos too, from a from a, a enforcement of hierarchical power to a community servicing role is very very difficult. Um, but I think those are tremendous points, and I, I totally agree with you, William. Uh, just a quick point um, about uh, about uh, law enforcement officers and professionals training um, training others training uh, training police. I mean, one thing we haven't talked about today is, I mean, the military they do have military policemen. Now, I, I understand that, you know, policing, <coughs> policing fellow soldiers is very different, or Marines is different from uh, policing in a civilian context, but having spoken to a lot of um, um, MP, Marine MP police trainers, I think there's a sense among them anyway that this is going to be a growing mission for them, and they seem to get it. They seem to get that distinction between poli civilian policing and military policing, but I think they bring a sensitivity and awareness in some circumstances that could be really useful, and particularly if the environment is is somewhat hot. I mean, a n number of mentors talked about having to sort of switch back and forth between mentoring and sort of um, security operations or quick reaction force. Not an ideal environment to be doing police mentoring in, but but one in which we might encounter in the future. And so I just, I throw that out there, is that, that sort of the MP cadre in the, in, in the U.S. military is a potential, potential reservoir. Thank you. Uh, if I may, I think uh, I should mention Walter made mention of the truck. I believe we both got hit by that same curricula truck. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I could just, just you, say Robert. one thing is, and part of this is a question, but I think one of the key things is uh, I absolutely agree that you need to have police professionals doing that training. But there also has to be important sensitization of those police professionals to the particular context to which they're going to deploy. The military receives some of, some of that sensitization training, so do civilians. I'm not sure, and I'm opening this question, is there that sort of sensitization training for U.S. police officers going into the field to understand the context in Afghanistan and, and, and others, because, or wherever, Bosnia, uh, Timor-Leste, and so on. Um, yeah. 14 days. Okay, 14 days. I think this is, this I is think this, better than nothing. But This yeah. is an extraordinarily yeah. important point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. USIP has started to train mentors who are going out to advise defense ministries. Yeah. We hope to do interior ministries as well, but it's an extremely important point. These are not normal yeah. environments that people are working in. They need to be prepared for, uh, uh, for these environments. If, if I, I just, just want to say one, it's also, Bob, about the training. I wrote a, a, a piece in a, a Canadian newspaper criticizing the reduction of training, and I got a note the next day from the NATO training mission who said that they've removed all leave days to make up for <laughs> the two extra weeks. So. That, and that, uh, I'm going to have to myself duck out to go do something else. I'm going to leave you in the able hands of uh, Bob Perito. 
and we're going to ask yes. the three next questioners. We'll take them all at once. Yes. Good uh, morning. And try to wrap up. M my name is Raid Al Madloum. Uh, I drove five hours to come here, and I'm probably the only Iraqi American here. Hmm. Yeah. This is how, you know, pathetic this being for the last seven years. Iraqi American had been excluded from the entire thing from day one. Uh, the only thing they can think that they can do is linguists or interpreters. I came here because you were one of my students. You arrived to Phoenix Academy late February 2008. Am I correct? You, you, were, sl you were slated to, to start your course on, Mar on March 1st, 2008. No. <laughs> you, you weren't? No, I went earlier. I, went a, a I, ha I have the schedule, and I have your name. Your major... Robert Byrd, March 1st, 2008. You came at the same time with Colonel Young. In any event, I worked for a year and a half training mid teams in Camp Taji. And there are obviously, there are so many observations that I can literally write a book. They were suburb fighters, but none of them can sell themselves. They're, you know, they were trained to be robots. And training police, especially in Iraq and in the Middle East, you need to be a good salesman. You need more social skills than anything else. I've written letters and letters after letter. Well, who was the command, uh, commandant when you were at Phoenix Academy? Was it McBride? No, I, Major McBride? Yeah, I went to, I was in Afghanistan earlier. I didn't go through this recent Phoenix Academy after it stood up. I, I was there before in 2004. I was in Iraq in 2006. You touched upon contractors, and this is one of the major problems, you know. I have, I have a letter, you know, tons of letters, including the State Department, starting in 2003. You know, they were bringing some Arab from the Middle East to train them, the ATAP program, train them under the uh, ATAP auspices, so they can go back to their country to train the Iraqi police on how to fight insurgency. And all these recruits, all these officers that come to this country, these Arab, non-Iraqi Arabs, are, they literally worship Saddam. How can you expect them to execute their fiduciary responsibility in training Iraqis how to fight Saddam loyalists? So the issue of contractors, the program manager that we worked under at Phoenix Academy, he was a retired officer the same rank as the commandant. And there was literally every single day turf war between the two. He thinks he is the one who should run the entire show to the point where the poor commandant had to hide in his office for the entire day. And his only, basically his only uh, 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 activity, this program manager, is how to proliferate the contract. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. So basically the whole thing is just a fiasco. Where are the Iraqi Americans? Where are they? Why, are, why don't you guys try to engage them? Why don't you try? You talked about, you know, culture. I've been writing about the, the culture issue for years to the State Department. To, I, I hounded the White House until they invited me in 2006 to meet with President Bush. And, and this is the only time he heard the Iraqi perspective, neutral Iraqi perspective. And when he understood the dynamics in Iraq, when thousands of you guys, well-spoken, you know, nicely dressed bureaucrats, failed to really explain to him the dynamics in Iraq, it was me who explained to him the dynamics in Iraq. And this is what really, that was the, the, the seed that was planted for the surge eventually. So you guys need to, engage Iraqi Americans because it is becoming, I mean, at, the, at that time we figured, you know, perhaps, perhaps, you know, that, that era, that disgraced era that's gone, gone, history, they intentionally did that so, 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 so the, the uh, event escalates, so the, the contracts, you know, proliferate. Prefer, prefer, Sir, and with, with all due respect, could I ask you to wrap up? We're at the end of our time. We have people that well, have been Thank you very much. This is basically you. what I wanted to, uh, to okay. say. Thank you very much. Please, we have two quick questions and then a final question over there, and then we'll give the panel one last shot, and we'll ask you to be patient. Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm Staff Sergeant Earl Beatty, United States, United States Marine Corps Reserve. I'm also a Maryland State Trooper. Um, one thing I've 
I've seen um, is that when we're mentoring, um, the police officers in a foreign country have trouble using discretion. Uh, and they have a lack of a clear understanding of their own law, which um, I, I myself, I'm gonna be working in Calvert County tomorrow, and I know I'll have the right, you know, whether I'll make a decision to write a speeding ticket or not. And it, it, the, the problems that I see within our own is that since there's no guide uh, within our own, we only know our own Western type of policing. So therefore, we should have an open mind about understanding the Eastern, Eastern laws, how they run their laws are, and are they clear on their understanding of the law? I know the illiteracy rate in Afghanistan is 90%, which is extremely difficult. So I'll, I'll right from the get-go, from tracking, apprehending, uh, you know, bad guys, you know, that kind of thing, we're, we're at a difficult task. And it's everybody's, everybody's problem that we all need to come together, have a good, clear understanding. They learn their laws, they get them trained up, more training, and then you deploy them to where they can use their own discretion. Right. And I think uh, good, good, we can get out of this point. awful mess. <laughs> Thank no, you. that's a good point. Please, you've been standing the longest. Thank you kindly. <clears throat> My name is Charles Wise. I'm the uh, RAC coordinator for the Foreign Service Institute, and I'm just back from my last assignment, 14 months on the ground in Ambar province as the senior rule of law advisor there. I would like to um, turn this toward a happier note for the ending and say that uh, due to the bravery of our Iraqi colleagues and so many of the different agencies who are at work in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, we have a great success story in AMBAR. The Marines under um, RCT-5 and RCT-8, Colonel John Love, Colonel Patrick Millay, under the Army, Colonel Stammer, uh, laid the groundwork for the civilians to come in. When I arrived on the ground, Colonel Millay turned over all the judge advocates in AMBAR to my control. He put me in the military chain of command. We worked closely with uh, especially INL out of Baghdad and the rule of law department, Doug Allen, Mike Carrasco. And I can tell you that we had a total turnaround in the hearts and minds of the people of Ambar. We went from 1,000 casualties from 2003 to 2008 to the time I was there, 2008 through 2010, we had one casualty. And that one casualty was immediately, his, his killers were immediately apprehended within 12 hours by the Iraqi police that we had all trained. So, um, what I want to ask the panel is, and thank, thank you, by the way, for the important work that you do in the forum that you give to us rule of law professionals to try to make our profession even better. But are you getting any of these nice reports, any of these happy, successful reports from the field, and uh, is everything always negative? Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. I had, I had very wait, positive. Wait. Oh, one more. One more, and then we'll close. We'll close the questions and we'll have the Thanks. panel respond. Please, go ahead. You've been waiting. Thank you. Uh, again, let me second the comments uh, of the audience. I'm Helene Kessler from the Office of Civilian Police and Rule of Law Programs at the Department of State in the Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement. And Bob, again, thank you for sponsoring uh, this event. I've certainly learned a lot. Um, but I, I also just wanted to make a comment in response to um, your accurate note that we need to, to professionalize and expand our excellent resources that we already um, already have. I've been given authority to hire more than 40 people for That's my office good. in Civilian Response Corps. Um, thank you. Uh, several of you mentioned the, the need for a quick civilian response. Um, we have Civilian Response Corps officers in a number of ex areas of expertise as well as additional uh, senior police corrections and justice advisors. So the assistant secretary in the Department of State agree with you, and I have a big job ahead of me. So thank you. Well, thank you. That's uh, that is good news. Okay, we'll ask the panel one quick series of responses, and then we'll call it call it a day. I appreciate everyone's attention to the issue. I think uh, having been in 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 Al Anbar and struggled with this, what we needed was someone there earlier. 2002, three, four, five, and and so I literally went looking for that person and couldn't find anyone. 
including going to the green zone. So it's there are a lot of people who are doing a lot of things. The, the question is, rule of law advisor, huge capability. Get those people out to the commanders who are making these resource decisions and provide them that capability because without that and with these professionals advising those commanders, they'll make the best decisions they can and help vet and select the best leaders of the local forces. Who better to determine the best police officer than another police officer when they're dealing with that other leader of that host nation? So I'm entirely optimistic, um, but I think we just need to bridge the gap between military resource and civilian and have them way earlier, even train together, even exercise together, even deploy routinely together so you have a relationship. And maybe that's a recommendation to AID. Thank you all for the time. David? Let me make a comment about an idea that surfaced here today, very short. And that has to do with this use of, uh, of not putting all our eggs in the basket of developing a national police uh, and using indigenous structures of both security and, and, and uh, adjudication and justice. It's a powerful argument. And, it is, and there is wonderful scholarship now, and I'm glad to see that I think USIP is going to play a role in this. There's wonderful scholarship on the richness of indigenous structures for providing both security and justice. All I want to say is, while I think this is right, that there is huge potential there, utilizing these, these local auspices, however, is a political act. We are foreigners in those countries, and when we begin to choose who has responsibility at local levels, apart from the national government, for things like security and justice. We are meddling in nation building in a huge way. And in the history of the, of the, of the development of Western nations shows that the location of, 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 the, of the authority to police, whether it's decentralized as it is here or centralized as it may be in France or decentralized in Brazil, et cetera, is hugely consequential. So that I think the potential is there. Working it under international auspices or under our own auspices in some of these places as an ANBAR, which I think is a success story. I, I happen to agree with that. And I think there are jirgas, for example, in Afghanistan, which can be used. But, but the decision to do that, who do you choose to do these things, is, is, is not something, is put it this way, is something that requires a lot of assessment, a lot of political sensitivity, and isn't just something that you can pluck off the tree as a solution to our, our frustrations with developing national institutions. Um, David Bailey's put it extremely well, I think. Um, one of the, and he makes the point about the essentially political nature of deciding who, who, who provides policing services. I would argue in a place as, I, I, I don't know what to, I apologize for the word, as, as radioactive as, as Afghanistan, particularly southern and eastern Afghanistan, even choosing the ANP is a political decision, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the relationship between the, the, the views of, of, of many people in these districts, I mean, their view of mostly U.S., but some British military uh, mentors, police mentors in Afghanistan. One of the things that really struck me, yes, they wanted more cultural awareness training, but it was less that. It was more more training on how to be a mentor. Mm -hmm. Nobody actually teaches these guys how to go about mentoring. And they said, well, we spent a lot of time on the range, and, you know, we had a couple of weeks of Dari. Um, you know, we, we got trained up on the 50 Cal. Uh, this is the Army. Um, but, you know, nobody taught us how to be mentors, and we just had to learn that stuff on the ground. I think that's, that, that's something I might want to reinforce. Who's ever doing the mentoring needs to be taught how to mentor. Anyway, although a lot of it is going to be natural um, skills, I, th I think. Um, people have to be handpicked. The other thing I wanted to mention um, in terms of mentoring, uh, some of the Marines I spoke to, um, and it was actually quite poignant. In some districts in Helmand, they said the corruption was so bad that it, it didn't make us physically sick but it made it impossible for us to forge relationships with these people, talking about the police. The level of depredation was so bad. We couldn't form the relationships that we needed to form to be effective mentors. Maybe that can be addressed in the mentoring training, but I think that's, that's something that's going to be um, a recurring, uh, recurring issue. Thank you. I, I think on that, that last point on corruption, and it brings uh, to bear an important issue, which is, and it's been mentioned, which is, of course, building up the institutions, building up interior ministries, human resources department to manage the police, and ensure, of course, that they're paid, and paid appropriately. 
that's I mean there is some uh, you know it's unclear about the evidence whether that would actually reduce corruption but uh, there is some strong indications with, that would say it would um, you know I, I you know if I could just say something briefly about this idea of using informal traditional structures I'm uh, also think that you have to to be very careful when when you're doing this and certainly foreigners uh, external actors have to be in the back seat not the driver's seat in terms of deciding which are legitimate, which should be used, and, and how they should be used. Um, I think one of the big criticisms, security sector reform in general as a concept tends to discourage the use of traditional mechanisms um, because, of course, this is a, a, a concept really rooted to fundamental Western principles of governance and security um, on the basis primarily that they violate fundamental human rights in many cases, uh, particularly in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, the rights of women and minority groups. And that's true. But my experience is looking at this, and USIP has highlighted this in many of its work, is many it, that these informal structures and their practices can be reconciled with fundamental uh, uh, Western principles and formal structures. And a collaborative relationship can be built between the state and these, and these structures. Now, will depend on the context and the specific institutions or structures, but I, I'm a firm believer that that's the case. But the ownership has to be clearly um, local actors. I just want to say my last point, and I just have a very, very brief anecdote about the need to contextualize this type of assistance. When On one of my recent trips to Afghanistan, I spent some time at the Law and Order Trust Fund for Afghanistan, their offices, the UNDP offices, uh, who are running this trust fund. And they provide some training to the Afghan police. And one of the things they were telling me about one of their training programs, which was consisted of a PowerPoint presentation about um, the UN resolution on gender and peace building. Now, this is a force that's 70 to 90 percent illiterate. And they're receiving a PowerPoint presentation for many, uh, for you know, uh, several thousand officers. Um, I, I could, would just have loved to be in the room to see how much of that was actually absorbed. And this is, you know, a, a lot of money is being, and time is being invested in, in, in programs such as these. Uh, we have to understand what are the actual needs, uh, what, uh, and, and really uh, attune them. Uh, to the local context. So I think that that is one of the main messages that I think. It, it's simple. It's something, it's a cliche, but it's just not necessarily done. Okay. I want to thank the audience for your patience and for staying with us. Uh, I'd like to invite a round of applause for our panel. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll be up here if you want to ask individual questions, and uh, we'll see you again. <laughs>